presentation of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service National Conservation Training Center, providing leadership in learning to conserve fish, wildlife, and natural resources. Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center, and I'd like to welcome you to another in our series of Conservationists in Action. This afternoon, we have a very exciting author and uh, wildlife journalist, Will Stoltzenberg, with us, who just finished a, a fascinating book uh, called Where the Wild Things Were. And before I uh, turn it over to Will, I'd like to just take care of a few housekeeping things. I'd like to remind you this is a live broadcast. Really appreciate you all tuning in. And if at any time you have a question about any of the topics Will's talking about as regards wildlife ecology, predators, and so on, please do contact us. You can phone us. You can email us, you can fax us a question, or those of you in classrooms that have the push to talk microphones can just push in the button and talk to us as the name implies. Because I, I think you are going to have some questions because Will is such a stimulating <laughs> writer and speaker. And let me just give you a little background. I couldn't give you his whole resume because uh, it's, it's quite impressive and, and long, but let me just give you a little background on Will before I, I turn it over to him. He's a, a wildlife journalist who for the past 20 years has been covering a beat called conservation biology, which a lot of us in Fish and Wildlife Service are familiar with. More specifically, he's been heralding the planet's sixth mass extinction he'll talk about in a bit, while celebrating its survivors wherever he might find them. He was a former science editor of Nature Conservancy magazine, where he profiled a lot of uh, conservation biology issues, a lot of these extinction issues. Uh, more recently, he's... he's uh, um, taking some time to complete a book, a fascinating book called Where the Wild Things Were, which explores the power of great predators and their role in wildlife ecosystems. It's a, it's a great book. I, I read it myself a couple weeks ago. It's in addition to wildlife ecology, it's a great nutshell history of how science uh, has changed dramatically, in some ways revolutionary ways in the last couple decades, and helps explain everything from why we have so many white-tailed deer here in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia uh, to what happens in, in tropical islands when they lose their large predators. It's a fascinating read, both informative and illustrative. Uh, he holds a master's degree in wildlife from New Mexico State University, where he explored very early on the science of predator control. He now writes from here in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, where we're located, a state where one in 57 motorists still collide with deer every year, and where wolves and cougar have been missing for nearly a century. And the link between the two, I think we'll explore a little later in the broadcast. But Will, uh, great welcome. We're, we're so Thank happy you. to have you out here at NCTC. Yeah. And we're very excited to, to get a very early look at this Thanks book that just came out, yeah. I think, a couple months ago. Yeah, July. Mm -hmm. oh, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask you is, is um, why you decided to write a book on this topic. You've been writing articles about this topic, but why, why cover it in a full-length book? Well, it was one of these things that, that came up in a, in a conference I was at, and um, it seemed to be one of the more interesting symposia that I, I had uh, visited that entire day. But also it seemed to be that there was just this groundswell of research on these top predators and their ecological roles in their communities. And uh, it seemed to me that nobody was quite telling the whole story. We got little bits and pieces here, um, little snippets, um, some of it in the scientific literature, a little bit of in, in the popular media. And I said, you know, why isn't somebody writing about this? So I just, well, this is something I'd really like to take on. <laughs> and the way we went. And, you know, there was nobody else out there doing it. So That's great. Yeah. That's exactly how Rachel Carson fell into Silent Spring, is that she kept on trying to get people to oh, write dear. about it. And, and she said, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as a male, Rachel Carson. But she said, why isn't anybody writing about yeah. it? And eventually she Absolutely. wrote about it. It's, yeah. a, it's a long lineage. One of the interesting things about the book, especially for people who have read a lot of conservation biology themed yeah. literature, is, is you have an interesting take on it. Mm -hmm. um, your book actually, I read a lot of these for this mm -hmm. series and so on, it, it, it comes across as, across as part history, part mystery, a lot of fascinating characters pop up. Did, did your background in journalism help influence the, the tack you decided to take on this? Well, I, I guess, um, you know, but I've always thought that, you know, I, I like following not only the wildlife, but I like following the scientists as yeah. animals themselves. You know, they're all just part of, of the bigger story. And so, I mean, I, I think to just have these dry figures who are chasing after, you know, the, the, the true stars of the story, I think misses half the story because one of the things about this that I mentioned in my book is that it's, it's one of the most difficult of all sciences, uh, not only ecology, but to be looking at these big predators, which, yes. you know, they come with their own, you know, kind of uh, a hook on our own psyches. 
And, you know, that's, that's a different aspect that a lot of science doesn't come with, and this one is particularly true, so you have to be very, very careful, and it makes for some, makes for some interesting debates. It, it, once again, it's a fascinating book, and if, if we yeah. punch up the, the book cover right now, it, it, I think that's a fairly typical idea of what we have, oh, um, we of what a, a predator is there. We, we have a, okay. a, a tiger. <laughs> Is that, is that a it's, tiger? it's actually a jaguar. It's fuzzy. It's, yeah. a, it's, jaguar. A, it's, it's a little, it's a little fuzzier yeah. on my monitor. Yeah. We have a jaguar. We have a large, charismatic megafauna. But the interesting thing about your book is, is actually it begins with perhaps an atypical predator that we looked at. And, yeah. And, and, uh -huh. and um, to go back to what you said a minute ago, a very oh, interesting yeah. scientist that yeah. was saying yeah. this. Why don't you tell us a little about it? Well, him? yeah. And I felt like I had to start with this because this was one of the seminal studies that led to some of the, the, the studies now that are looking at the bigger beasts um, like jaguars and such. But this is, this is Robert T. Payne of the University of Washington, a professor emeritus now. And uh, he's holding a starfish in his hand there. And in the, um, in the center of that picture, in the mouth of the starfish, uh, is a mussel. And he, he conducted this ingenious experiment about 40 years ago now on the coast of Washington, this very place right here, um, to test the powers of, of a predator over its prey. And he had this really simple ecosystem that made it all possible. And it's this rock here. He has the top predator in his hand, which is the starfish. And he has the starfish's uh, main prey in the starfish's mouth. And in between, we have about 13 other species on this rock. So it's a convenient little kind of kitchen-sized ecosystem where he could essentially play God. He went out there every month, and he chucked every, one, every last one of those starfish from the rock to see how things would change. And lo and behold, things changed rather rapidly. He came back, and after doing this month after month, uh, within a year, that that, um, that rock had lost half of its species. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens, or that's what happened with this particular case, where he takes the top predator out, and all of a sudden uh, things start to fall apart. And he came up uh, uh, with a, a term for this sort of species. He called it a keystone species. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, it's got a disproportionate power over its ecosystem, um, given its relative scarcity. And he named this a keystone species because the idea was you take these things out of the archway of life, and things have a tendency to crumble. Very interesting. Yeah. And, and then after his work, we started to find a few other keystone species. Yeah, didn't af we? after that, we um, uh, one of the first and, and, and most famous studies to come after that was uh, a work done by James Estes out of the University of California, uh, Santa Cruz, uh, working on sea otters in the Aleutians. And uh, Jim went out in the Aleutians and didn't quite know what he was going to be looking at, but he decided uh, through Payne's advice that he was going to look at uh, the uh, the otter's influence on its ecosystem, and he had a uh, a really interesting study already set up for him too. I'm not sure if we have anything on that here. Yeah, um, he, uh, he went out in the Aleutians and he started looking at places that had otters and places that didn't. Now he was lucky in that uh, history had already had set this experiment up for him and that the fur hunters had already taken out upwards of 800,000 of these sea otters uh, in the last century and a half or so. And so these sea otters were just on the brink of extinction, started to build back. They uh, had uh, recolonized some islands, had, had not recolonized other ones. He was able to go and look at places with and without, without having to do all the messy uh, details <laughs> yeah. himself, which would have been pretty awful in this day and age. But anyway, this is what uh, Jim Estes found when he dove um, in, in places that did have otters. Yeah. These are kelp forests, and these are some of the most important communities of, of life in the near shore uh, marine community. And uh, this is what he found when he, uh, places that did have otters, and I, do we have, yeah. That's <laughs> what happens, and after. yeah, before and after. It's a pretty stark. This is called an urchin barren. And uh, this is what happens when you don't have sea otters around, which like to eat the urchins. Mm -hmm. Now, the urchins, they're herbivores. Uh, I like to think of them as a living chainsaw, and they can do to the, the kelp forest what a living chainsaw can do to, a, a, say, a tropical rainforest. And this is what happened. Place after place, otters with had kelp, otters without, we have this, the urchin barons. And so that was another really stark example of this keystone predator that uh, Bob Payne had, had made famous. Great. And it's been a classic ever since. Yeah. And, and we had Jim out here on an earlier iteration of this yep. show a number mm -hmm. of years ago with, with Michael Soule, and, and he yep. did talk about that. Very fascinating. Yeah. But once again, we're talking about predators people don't necessarily think of as predators and so on. So very interesting. And, and so yeah, far, both examples have been in the Pacific Coast. Is that correct? Uh, so far, yeah. So we're far. out in the uh, Pacific Coast, far Pacific, and then the, um, the Aleutians. So we're, we're way out there in the North, North Pacific with Jim's studies. Yeah. One of the things that was really interesting about your book is it was almost a travelogue of, of yeah. predation <laughs> and the loss of predators and the, the disastrous effects. And, and, and you went all over the world to examine this, both near and far. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the, the most striking ones, I thought, was Venezuela. Tell us a little what's happening in Venezuela. Venezuela. Uh, we may have something on that. Well, that, that, I just wanted 
um, Venezuela. This is the. Uh, um, I, well, let's go ahead to the Venezuela. <laughs> Venezuela. You've got to tell us what that skull okay. is. Okay. Right. Uh, right. uh, I, I wanted. I actually wanted to skip over this because <laughs> this is a very. This this goes along with Jim's study, and it's very controversial. But uh, since then, I, I I neglected to mention that the sea otters, since they were coming back and building to uh, what they call carrying capacity, they have since begun to crash again. In the uh -huh. mid '90s, they started to crash again. Uh, the big question was why, and they couldn't figure out why these animals were disappearing. It wasn't disease, you know, they, they just couldn't, it wasn't food, you know, they, they, they just couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, Jim Estes and colleagues uh, came up with a hypothesis, and this was after watching several killer whales eat yeah. sea otter. They thought, well, all right, this is weird. We haven't seen this in 20 years of watching sea otters. What's going on? Well, they did some calculations, and they determined that, indeed, it would only take a few killer whales to wipe out every one of those 40,000 otters wow. that were missing from the ecosystem. Um, they have this enormous appetites. You know, they burn calories like crazy. And so they came up with this idea that this could be the reason that these otters are um, disappearing. Now, that wasn't actually the most controversial aspect. They've gone a step further to not only tie the killer whales to the sea otter's disappearance, but to a, what they call a sequen sequential decline of a lot of other things in the North Pacific. We have uh, sea lions disappearing as well, and uh, harbor seals. And so um, the idea is that perhaps uh, people are pretty much on board with the idea that the, that the killer whales may have done a number on the otters, mm -hmm. but the idea that they have also uh, been behind some of the loss of the, of the pinnipeds, the seals, uh, is very highly controversial because and this, just to finish the story here, the reason that they think, why would the killer whales all of a sudden get hungry and go after the smaller prey, um, is because they think that they're missing their big prey. And that, they think, comes back to the whalers. That mm -hmm. after World War II, the whalers set sail and they took uh, uh, somewhere in the uh, neighborhood of three and a half billion uh, tons, tons of pounds, must be tons, um, of whale meat out of the North Pacific. And that, to Estes and, and uh, uh, a researcher named Alan Springer out of U University of Alaska and some colleagues, they decided this is a possible explanation for why uh, the killer whales would all of a sudden get hungry. Maybe not all of them, maybe just a few of them, or maybe all of them just switched right. their diet ever so slightly and started going down the food chain, eating smaller and smaller on the food chain. It's a highly controversial hypothesis, but it's just, it's thrown out there as an idea to explain these these uh, these changes in the North Pacific. So th there's that, and um, <laughs> and now we can go to Venezuela. Now we can go to Venezuela. We're talking about you know going lower and lower on the yeah. food chain. This example in Venezuela is a classic. Uh, one, uh, yeah. Well, th this was another uh, an accident of history that uh, uh, um, a researcher named John Turborg out of uh, Duke University came upon. Um, this uh, hydroelectric dam went up in east central Venezuela, and when it did, it flooded this tract of tropical forest about the size of Connecticut. And what was left I in this uh, in this forest, or what was left of the forest, were these hilltop islands, hundreds of them. Uh, and, the, and the interesting thing about these islands was that they were, most of them were too small, too small for the big predators. And the right. big predators of this area are the jaguar, the harpy eagle, and the puma. Uh, not, not big enough to support them, but it, they were big enough to support its prey. And so when John Turberg went down there, all he found was these prey species <laughs> amassing to um, uh, abnormal quantities, uh, you know, tens to hundreds of times higher than you could find on the adjacent mainland. And he went down there with his search crew and spent 10 years kind of documenting the, as well, and to give the story away, the decay of Lago okay. Guri and the islands in Lago Guri. Yeah. And what did he see on the islands exactly? Well, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of things. A couple of the ones that, that stand out. Um, there was, uh, for example, howler monkeys had uh, accumulated to about 20 to 30 times their normal densities, or at least they were stranded at those densities. Mm -hmm. um, and howler monkey society seemed to take a turn for the worse. They're very social animals. They live in family groups. And uh, the researchers that were watching these howler monkeys decided that, you know, after all, these weren't very happy monkeys. You know, <laughs> to put it on scientifically, these, these howler monkeys, um, you know, they, they, were, they, were, they weren't sleeping together anymore. They usually sleep in trees. You know, <laughs> they, weren't, they, they weren't grooming each other anymore. Their babies weren't playing. They were signs of infanticide. Their weights had dropped drastically. Um, they, uh, the howler monkeys, you know, the, the, the metaphor for it all, the howler monkeys of Lago Guri no longer howled. <laughs> and it just seemed like, you know, something had gone terribly wrong in right. this supposed paradise free of predators. Um, the other example that, uh, uh, that was really striking on Guri was that the island seemed to have been taken over in many cases by an ant. Um, it was a leafcutter ant, and these ants amassed to about 100 times their density uh, that you would find on the mainland, again, because they didn't have their predators anymore. They had, uh, there was no armadillos on most of these smaller islands. There was no army ants, which didn't have enough room to actually make a living 
eating animals like that. So they were gone, and um, these leafcutter ants went out and did what they normally do, which is normally not a big deal on the mainland, but on these tiny islands, they started basically denuding the islands. They go out, they clip these leaves, they take them back to their underground nest, they, they chew them up into a pulp and then make a compost, and on this compost they make uh, they grow these gardens of fungus. They are gardeners, farmers of fungus, if you will, a fascinating creature. But, you know, on these tiny islands, they started doing n a number on the trees, and it turned these trees into these leafy jungles and these bare and sort of thorny, uh, toxic sort of places that the, the researchers just, just cursed because they couldn't get through them. It was either bare ground, you know, or it was, you know, having to hack their way through with machetes. So the only things that would grow there, which would be thorny things and, and, and toxic things, which just did not get eaten. Yeah, which yeah. came out nicely in the book. I mean, well, the difference between reading a book and talking about a book is, yeah. is you don't get the rich anecdotes of, of um, what a miserable time the researchers had. I mean, they exactly. seem to be like the howler monkeys at the end, really unhappy <laughs> on the island. Oh, themselves. yeah, they had, they had one island, they called it Sudor, <laughs> which is Spanish for sweat. And they found out that earlier it had been named Difficil. Difficult, you know, because everybody just hated these places, you know. It's, you know, it's just, just hell on, on Earth. But everything from these islands to these marine ecosystems, the, the, the theme that joins them is, is basically systems decaying or becoming more chaotic because of the removal of the, the, the primary predators. There. In these places, yeah. You know, and, and, and of course, this is not to suggest that this happens everywhere. Right. You know, some people take it that way that, you know, this is the new, the, the grand theory of life. And it's, it's not the case. What they are saying is that we need to look more and more. And because the more we do look, it's funny, we find more of these cases. It just yeah. so happens that it's a very difficult subject to wrap, get your arms to wrap around, and so, but the, the handwriting is on the wall. When they start looking, you know, lo and behold, they find these abnormalities. Well, one of the things conservation biologists are, are trained in, and I was trained in as a graduate student, is, is oftentimes uh, field work is, is far from home. <laughs> one of the nice things about your book is it isn't just examples from Venezuela or, or Pacific Ocean and so mm -hmm. on. There's, there's um, some of these same effects potentially happening in, in, in our own backyards and so on. And, and yeah. I wonder if you talk a little about meso predators now and what we live with. Well, let's see what we have next on here. Um, we, this is a good, good subject to talk about. Um, Turborg, when he left Lago Guri, he, he left with a warning saying, you know, this is not just Lago Guri. This, this is a global preview yeah. of what we're seeing on Lago Guri. Turborg actually grew up just out, he grew up in Arlington, Virginia, uh, just outside of D.C., not too far from here. Um, this, this picture actually was taken right here on the NCTC training grounds, <laughs> and uh, this is not an unusual sight. And in mm -hmm. fact, there's, uh, you know, you can see herds a lot thicker than this. Uh, but the interesting thing is that what Turborg was describing about prey populations running amok is, 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 uh, is certainly the case for deer in this country. Now, I want to preface that by saying it's not all predators. You know, the reason that we have so many deer is because deer like us. You know, we yeah. give them a lot. We feed them. We, uh, we have crops and we have uh, delicious shrubs and tulips and things like that. For We also clear for them. They're a species of the edge. And so we've just made this paradise for deer. But another thing that has made life a lot easier for deer is that they don't have predators anymore in most places. Uh, not only four-legged, but two-legged. You know, people aren't hunting as much anymore these days. You know, this is more of, of a suburban sort of a culture. And in a lot of places, the hunting has kind of dropped off as, as a hobby, um, as a recreation. And again, um, we've also gotten rid of their four-legged predators. We don't have wolves, uh, you know, right. for 5% for, for of their historic range in this country. Cougars, none of them left east of the Great Plains. We have a few stragglers coming over, but for the most part, we've just made life incredibly nice for deer. And they've, uh, ecologists are finding that they're starting to do a big number on ecosystems, just like the ants were doing at Lago Guri. What are some of the effects of deer on the ecosystem? Well, they are, um, uh, for one thing, they're, uh, they're shortchanging the next generation of forest. We have places in Pennsylvania, for example, whereby in order to grow a harvestable timber anymore, you've got to put a fence around it. I mean, they have basically mm -hmm. half the state is in reproductive arrest right now in terms of growing the next generation of forest. Nothing is growing or hardly anything is growing beyond the molar zone of a deer. Uh, that's, the, that's the commercial aspect of it. We also have um, we also have counts of wildflowers disappearing. You know, we have places like Wisconsin statewide. Right. They, did a, they did a survey statewide and found one out of every five wildflower understory species are dis have disappeared over the last 50 years in that state. One in wow. five. And, and what's left there is not, is, is not just, you know, uh, four out of five, but what's left there is this different cast of very common sort of weedy sort of, uh, right. of plants. So, so they're changing the whole character of it, not only loss of diversity, but loss of, of, of 
uniqueness, if you will, uh, and that's, that's disturbing. We also have concerns for shrub uh, and ground nesting birds. They're losing their habitat, and you have to wonder what's, what's going on with them. God, you could just go on, you yeah. know, it, it hits us too. We've got outbreaks of Lyme disease, 15,000 15, to some people say 150,000 cases of Lyme disease in this country every year, and you know, the fact is that we get, we get Lyme from a tick, and, we, and we, the tick is harbored in great numbers on deer. Uh, one of the, the major hosts for the tick and so you know we can look at it that way we have people slamming into deer you know we have yeah. 150 of us dying every day every year uh, hitting deer you know so you, it's just a, it's just a whole chain of events that is, is just really disturbing with this many deer in the environment yeah I mean anecdotally uh, Wisconsin where I grew up it's, it's a tremendous number of deer just in the 40 years or so I've been mm -hmm. around uh, compared to when I was a young Boy, and, and we never had Lyme disease and so on. That's come yep. in. Yeah. Uh, my daughter's caught it out here. I mean, it does seem it's serious. And it totally. But what's nice about your book is there's a, a scientific theory behind it, <laughs> and there's a, all this uh, corroborating evidence. We're not just seeing it in Wisconsin or West Virginia. We're seeing some of these same situations Absolutely. everywhere from Venezuela to uh, you know to the marine ecosystems. Absolutely. And I'd like to just break away here for a second and remind folks um, this is a live broadcast. We would appreciate any questions you might have if you have a phone or an email or uh, a fax, please do send in a question for Will. He'd be happy to answer it. To try. Uh, <laughs> or make up a plausible yeah, we'll answer. <laughs> and, uh, he'll you and me, he'll answer it. Answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, but as we're rushing uh, quickly through this, don't don't feel hesitant to call in with a question because I know a lot of you work in this field and it, it, it's fascinating. It lends itself to a lot of questions. And one of the questions I'd like to go to um, is, is what happens to, to niches uh, when the primary predators are gone? You, you use the term mesopredators and so on. What? Yeah. Uh, tell us a little about that. I think people may have heard of keystone species or yeah. may not, but th this was a new term to me, actually. Well, you, most people have heard of the principle, you know, when the cat's away, the mice will play. Right. Well, <laughs> when the lion's away, the, the, the cats will play. <laughs> and then here's a new one. And th these cats, and along with them, raccoons, and let me see, will we got anything on here? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, raccoons, possums, cats, foxes, coyotes in some places, mm -hmm. uh, crows and whatnot. Um, these uh, second order or mid-size or mesopredators, if you will, um, they also have been appearing in abnormal quantities in many places. And again, it's, it's very much like the white-tailed deer. It's not, you know, nobody is saying that this is all because of the lack of the big predators. Right. Um, they are one of many factors that have contributed to um, all of these animals kind of swarming our neighborhoods and our woodlands is because it's like with the deer, you know, they like us. They make things. They like what we have. We have, you know, pet food on the back porch. We have garbage in the carport. We have chicken in the coops. <laughs> these sort of things, you know, and it makes life very easy. But on top of that, they don't anymore in most places have wolves or mountain lions on their tails. And it makes life uh, incredibly easy for them. And they, in turn, um, in many places, are having a number on the animals be beneath them. When their populations explode, you can expect that, that the animals that are uh, normally preyed on by them are going to undertake a hit. And, in, and indeed, we do s have some concerns for missing uh, songbirds in this country. Um, we do have a lot of other small mammals that we have concerns for. One of the most, uh, one of the most uh, destructive of the measles predators is our own household cat. You know, the, the house cat um, is credited with somewhere of, uh, in the neighborhood of 33 extinctions worldwide. And I'll say that most of those, uh, most of those are, um, yeah, most of those are seabirds. But, uh, you know, also on the mainland, we now we have in this country anywhere from uh, 60 to 100 million wow. uh, house cats, both feral populations and ones that we just let out for the night to have their fun coming back. And some of these cats are taking upwards of uh, anywhere from 1,000 animals in a year. And in total, we think that uh, the estimate is, this is all really rough science, but upwards of a billion small animals are being taken from, you know, the, the voles and mice, baby rabbits, uh, hundreds of millions of songbirds, um, doing a great number on, on some of our, our wildlife species out there. So, yeah. And they're not filling the function of the previous predators that were there. Well, that's the thing, yeah. The, I mean, the, the, you know, normally a big predator wouldn't be eating these, these smaller ones. And so it, what we've d done is replaced this one big rare sort of predator with hordes of smaller ones. And, and again, when they're allowed to be hordes, if you will, at these abnormal um, densities and abundances, that they, you know, th th their prey really takes a hit. That's fascinating. Yeah. I don't remember if you referenced it in your book, but... Uh, 
Charles Darwin had that interesting uh, chapter in The Origin of Species where he talked about how the, I think it was the red clover population was influenced by the number Bumble of cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he, but he, you know, he skipped a few steps genius. and said cats, and then it was really exactly what you did. The cats control the mouse population, the mice yeah. break up the, uh, the honeycombs and so yeah. on, and this is what we're talking about. Yeah. But if you extend it out, then the cats increase and eventually... Um, you know, you lose things in there, but but he's a smart guy. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this book isn't quite as revolutionary as the Origin of Species, but a very close second. Yeah. yeah. Well, so far it's been fairly doom and gloom, kind of uh, uh, bollocked up ecosystem, <laughs> mildly that are that yeah. are out of control. Yeah. Uh, but you also talk about Yellowstone, which is a slightly more eventually a slightly more positive story and when people yeah. what was neat about yellowstone and, and please lead us into it but one of the neat things that came out in your book is is it finally provided some positive evidence as opposed to saying things are gone and this is what it looks like unless you had a little place where you could pull off starfish and so on mm -hmm. you were actually able to reverse mildly some of the effects and see what the um yeah. outcome would be it's, yeah. uh, conservation biology is not a good laboratory science so it's always been problematic reproducing results Absolutely. especially with big the big carnivores yeah. and that's why you know a lot of the studies have come from these smaller ones but um yellowstone yeah has provided this this rare window into the life of, of a big carnivore and that is the wolf uh the wolves had been gone since 1926 in yellowstone mm -hmm. uh they were shot out trapped out by our own government uh and then um in 1995 they came back you know it took a long bit of wrangling um with the Endangered Species Act behind us, but we brought the wolves back and they spread, they did very well, and they, they started doing what wolves do in Yellowstone, which was they kill big animals. And the big animals of, of most importance in Yellowstone were the elk. They had a herd of about 20,000 in the Northern Range that uh, had been doing a big number on the, uh, the, the uh, riparian or the streamside communities there. They were eating the cottonwoods and the willows down to nubs. And we had, we had trees that were you know, 70 years old that were you know, as basically ankle high to an elk. Um, just every year they'd come up, they'd get, they'd get chopped back down again. And so um, what happened soon after the wolves, and again, there's, there is some controversy about this. There's a lot of people who want to wait another few decades to really see how this all shakes out. But here's the uncanny coincidence that when, uh, when wolves were uh, extirpated from Yellowstone National Park is about the time that these willows and the aspen and the cottonwoods, they all stopped growing. Uh, when they came back within three or four years, things started growing again. Um, you know, this is all correlation, and, and yeah, there are still are some big questions about this, but the idea is that perhaps the wolves, not only in, in decreasing slightly the, the number of elk in the park, but in chasing the elk and, in, and instilling in them what, uh, what they like to call an ecology of fear into these wolves and keeping them moving instead of just lounging all day in these stream sites and, and having their way with the plant communities, these elk are acting more like elk anymore, you know, and they're, they're going to places where they're not as, as apt to uh, be killed. They don't, they don't want to be, as I say, caught dead in places like this. And so um, that's the idea behind uh, several researchers who think this is the sort of um, resurrection we're seeing in Yellowstone. And they're thinking, well, maybe if this happens in Yellowstone, maybe there's chances for this in other places. And I think actually, here's, here's, a, here's a graphic of what they think is happening. And you can see on the left-hand side, we have the elk again just lounging in the stream sides. And we have uh, the stream sides are bare for the most part that's eroding. And, um, in the right-hand side, there's where wolves have come back. We see the elk are standing warily off to the upper right-hand corner there. We have that big bull elk down there who's probably not just not caring about the wolves yeah. at all. Because, you know, a lot, of, a lot of elk, they are, they are dangerous animals, and they're, they're a formidable adversary for wolves, and the healthy ones oftentimes don't have a lot to worry about. But we also see in the foreground, we see beaver. Beaver have come back since the wolves have come back. Twelve new, um, last count, I'm probably behind now, twelve new, at last count, uh, beaver colonies in the north um, range of Yellowstone and with the beavers they bring a host of wildlife in their own so we've got one keystone species the wolf bringing another keystone species the beaver and 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 on and on so it's just a, and I also mentioned that carcass up there don't forget that we we know for sure that that wolves are feeding a lot of other wildlife in this park with that carcass you see that grizzly bear coming in there that he's going to make a meal of that but there's a whole host of of scavengers and other carnivores that are making a good living on wolf uh, leftovers so it's it's a wonderful sort of a resurrection story in, in Yellowstone, and you know it's it's still it's still I I would agree maybe that in ten years we might be thinking a little bit differently about what's happening there, but right now it's it's every bit looking like the wolf is at least having a significant role in in the way things are changing there. One of the things that came up when you looked at Yellowstone was how different 
uh, wolves are as hunters compared to humans. Talk a little about that and, and, and the prey that they select and, and, and their impact on the herd. Yeah, well, you know, as you might expect, you know, people who hunt sportsmen who, who go after game, they like to come back with, with the biggest and the healthiest, <laughs> the biggest right. rack, which shows your, your vitality, you know. But uh, the wolves, they, you know, they don't like getting um, you know, kicked to death. And, and they like to go, and they're very good at this, at singling out animals that are hurting, and the, the young animals, small animals, animals that are uh, hobbling and whatnot. They're very, very keen to pick them out of a herd. And, and so what we have is we have a weeding of of the um, the abnormal animals or the weak and the sick and you know and, and, and this is not old this is this is old news it's not right. new um, but they've been confirming this in Yellowstone um, the other thing again the hunters they like to they like to take the cream of the crop but the, the other thing about hunters is they're out there they have seasons they have you know a, a month or two maybe three when you count both season that they're out there they can be hunting these animals the rest of the year it's it's open season for the elk that is you know but with a wolf out there they're out there the whole year and the elk have to be watching their backsides the entire time and so they don't they don't give the elk a rest whereby the hunters do and in a lot of cases the hunters cannot have the impact that a wolf can um, the other thing that happens is is again this carcass issue where you have uh, wolves leading um, carcass and, and, and gut piles and stuff for animals to come by and uh, and feed on all year round that doesn't happen with the hunting season you know there's this this flush of of gut piles left over from the hunters and, and, and the grizzly bears come and they take it and whatnot but for the rest of the year uh, you know they're coming out of hibernation in the spring it's not there for them so it's kind of a, it's almost a false sense of security when they have this this flush of food in the fall and it's not there when they come out in the spring so again uh, the wolf is just a more consistent provider if you will I mean one of the interesting things was uh, really in a sense the the predators strengthen the prey uh, and that the, the elk herd could potentially be more healthy being with wolves and then just being on their own. If they are weeding out the, yeah. the abnormal or the, the, the sick and so on, culling the herd as it is, um, they're almost having a, a, a totally different effect, as you noted, from hunters. And, and that, mm -hmm. um, one gets the impression reading your book that people had a sense of that and they viewed it in places like Isle Royale and so on, but Yellowstone really um, confirmed it. There was so much prey there. I think even our yeah. biologists are wondering, what are the wolves going to go after? <laughs> yeah, and you know that was the wonderful thing about Yellowstone is that it was it's so open and so visual. You just you know you can stand up there on the hillside. If you've ever been to Yellowstone, you know right where to you go to the Lamar Valley, and all you got to do is you look look on the side of the road, and you can see a, a big bunch of cars parked there, and a bunch of people on the side of the the hill with right. spotting scopes. If you want to go see wolves, you just go find that bunch of people and go stand with them, and they'll point out the wolves to you. It's just the most spectacular viewing of a big carnivore like the wolf that we've ever had. Not even in Alaska and Denali have people gotten these sorts of intimate day after day glimpses of wolf society. And plus, they had people in airplanes every day. I mean, it's right. just a spectacular scientific uh, piece of work that, that uh, Yellowstone has become. Yeah. As your story continued, people discovered chaotic or decaying systems, minus predators. They had some examples of, of predators um, helping strengthen a system, strengthen prey and so on. And, and this led to, um, and it's all happening together. It's not a strict chronological thing, mm -hmm. but it led to, to, to talk about uh, rewilding, which may be a new concept actually to a, to a lot of our viewers. Um, and I wonder if you'd like to talk a little about where that idea came from, what it was, and, and the controversies, probably the most controversial thing you talked about in, in many ways. In yeah. The book. yeah. You know, I, I and once again, these are your ideas. You're, yeah. you're, no, I'm, you're reporting I'm just the messenger. them, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we thought that the, the sequential collapse um, idea of Jim Estes and company was controversial. Well, this, one's, this one beats that by a long shot. This is rewilding. And about three years ago, 12 scientists got together and they, they were looking at, you know, the kind of a uh, the sky's the limit sort of question on how to restore the wildness of North America and what they did was they said all oh, the heck with you know 50 100 years ago to heck with the landing of Columbus or Lewis and Clark's venture across the country if, if we we want to go for the, the real baseline and we want to go for well let's see let's go to when people first stepped foot in this continent which is about 13,000 years ago as best we know um, that's when we really believe that things started to go downhill in a big way um, had a big mass extinction of the megafauna shortly after that for whatever reason a lot of people think it was us but anyway if that was if, if that was the most glorious this continent has been since we stepped foot on it let's go for that 
And so they said, well, okay, let's look at the animals that were here. And so we had, we had mammoths running around. We had lions that were very closely related to the African right. lion. We had huge camels. We had horses. We had giant ground sloths. We had saber-toothed cats. We had bears twice the size. I mean, it was just an incredible megafauna. They said, well, okay, some of these animals um, are still existing. You know, there's actually subspecies of the sure. African lion. And it's the African, or the, the American lion is the African lion. Uh, we still have something rather ecologically close to the elephants, or the mastodons, or the ma mammoths. We have, we have elephants. And right. we say, well, let's take some of these zoo animals and whatnot, and let's try these big fenced experiments. You know, let's put, you know, let's open up some of these big areas in the unpeopled spaces of the American West, put a fence around them, and, and add, you know, say, uh, elephants and lions and cheetahs mm -hmm. and, and camels and horses and and let's see what happens um, and the idea again was that this isn't this is the one thing that most people missed about this is that you know they were suggesting experiments they weren't right. you know as they like to say they weren't suggesting you know backing up a truck to Topeka and dumping out a bunch of elephants right. or lions they said we're gonna do this in controlled experiments the other thing that was very important in their message is that look if we do nothing right now if we accept the status quo we're going downhill because we've shown, as some of the, the, the points that we've been talking about there, when you do without the big beasts, things tend to decay. And so the status quo was not cutting it. Even if we just held on to these open spaces that we have, they're going to continue to get decay unless we p put back the ecological players, these big animals. And they say, we should, we should try this. As responsible conservationists, we ought to try this. And, uh, you know, the, the proverbial dung hit the fan when that came out um, of course you know they got all sorts of letters and thousands of emails you know coming to them just excoriating them for you know having the audacity to suggest such a thing which, which was all again for an idea and just right. floated this idea but boy people people did not much care for, for the most part <laughs> there, there were some people out there who would say yeah I like that you know I've got a big ranch you know I maybe we could make some money on that go ahead bring them on but for the most part those were the minority yeah was it ever tried anywhere did we ever well, end up with a U.S. ecological history part? Yeah, no, um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're in Texas right now, there's mm -hmm. a lot of big game ranchers who are yeah. experimenting with these things, but they're not really doing it in a scientific manner. They're putting things out there that people like to shoot, and, or maybe would come, you know, in a car and see and whatnot. But they have a lot of these animals that people are afraid of. They're already out there, you know, in some places. Sure. We just don't, you know, they're not public knowledge for the most part. So uh, a, a lot of what they're suggesting was really not that far out. But, boy, the way people, the way people took it was, was another thing entirely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the examples that, that struck is we still have, certain species that are from this Pleistocene era, like condors and so on, that might have evolved feeding on exactly. this, this giant megafauna. Yeah. And uh, perhaps one of the reasons it's so difficult to bring back condors, it's been such a slow and arduous process, is, is we've eliminated what they're used to eating or, or um, the prey that larger <laughs> predators used to kill and so yeah. on. That was a fascinating point because I, we often yeah. cavalierly talk about, I do it all the time, a condor is a Pleistocene relic without thinking about the yeah. repercussions of that. It's been around a long time, yeah. you know, but what, as to what it eats, that's, that's a great the point. critical yeah. question. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by the, the status quo was killing us. I mean, to say that we've got condors flying out there and we're propping them up by keep, you know, putting food out for them and whatnot, you, you got to be asking yourself, what's missing here? <laughs> what's missing are big carcasses for these things to feed on. And, you know, you got to put two and two together in some cases if you really want to recover um, endangered species and, and endangered ecosystems. The, the whole rewilding, the, the, the need to bring back larger carnivores and so on, mm -hmm. also ties into the issue of, of corridors. Talk a little about that, about the territorial needs of, of predators and some of the challenges that's posed. Well, corridors, yeah. The idea there is that, you know, no one's suggesting that you're just going to open up, you know, half the United States to these preserves where people right. stay out, put fences around them and whatnot. But the idea is that if we can just save these core areas that are big enough to maintain some populations, at least a, a, a small but maybe a viable population, um, we, can, uh, we can accentuate those populations by having several of these mm -hmm. cores that are in some way interconnected, where you can get the occasional gene flow just to keep the populations going, where they, they have these rescue effects where things kind of fall apart. Here we have another, we have the rescuers coming across the land. But what that means is that you have to have the land in between still somewhat hospitable for these animals and it's you've got to, it can't be a gauntlet whereby you know people are just lining up to see right. who's going to make it it's got to be a little bit more friendly and so that's the idea whereby you provide these these corridors that aren't 
pure nature reserves as most of us think of, but they are at least good enough they will provide access for animals to go between these more um, pristine, if you will, pieces of nature. In some sense, have based on some of these new discoveries, and uh, assuming they're right, um, just for the sake of argument, mm -hmm. in some sense have, have federal agencies, federal conservation agencies, or environmental groups um, been focused on, on some of the wrong targets, do you think, in the environmental movement? Well, you know, that actually has been suggested of the big carnivores, um, that, that, you know, the, you know, we have this megafauna bias, and a lot of people who are interested, in, well, there's not a lot of people, but <laughs> Uh, those who are interested in the smaller things, the little things that run the world, as E.O. Wilson mm -hmm. likes to put it, you know, they deserve our respect too, but, you know, they don't get a whole lot of funding. The, the idea, though, is, and, and I, I think the argument should be, is that, look, none of our, our endangered species are getting the right funding. I don't think none of them are getting nearly what they need. I think this is, I hope this doesn't sound too political, but I did mm -hmm. some calculations where I think that the, the total budget for the, the endangered species, um, the recovery of endangered species in this country, I think there's a little over a thousand of them. Um, I think it's 1.4 billion or something like that. I mean, we spend that in, what, three and a half days in occupying Iraq, all right? So, I mean, just, just a, a sense for our priorities in this country about, you know, where we put our money. So to those who say, you know, you're putting too much money into big charismatic megafauna, I would just have that to say is that, uh, number one, we're showing that they are important. You know, some of them are not just another species, they're keystone species, and then perhaps maybe they do deserve more money. But the other thing is that nobody's getting enough money in terms of wildlife. And so, uh, if you want to talk about um, too much money for uh, the big predators, I would say too little money for the little things. So let's ramp it up on both ends, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. What are some things we could do pragmatically to bring back large predators today? Well, um, here's one of them. Uh, we we know that you know we know that that wolves um, when they're uh, first introduced to a, a landscape of sheep there's going to be problems and in the West this is one of our, our biggest tests right now is that we have wolves that are in a land of of livestock for a lot of places if you want to have them outside of the, the parks um, that's what it's going to have to be because livestock is everywhere in the West um, the idea that you know the two can't get along I think is being challenged now and in pragmatic sense we have. Um, the Defenders of Wildlife, for example, they have a program now whereby in the, uh, the Wood River Valley of Idaho, they have a, a kind of a, a showcase model for how the two can get along. They have the, one, of, one of the largest sheep herds, or a couple of the largest sheep herds in, in all of the West out there that are now being tended by shepherds who are um, using these, and I think in this picture you can see it as a, a um, an electric fence, these mm -hmm. are portable corrals that every night that they can put these around the, the sheep. It's just a little electric fence and these ridiculous little flags, they call them flatery. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, these things uh, spook wolves to the <laughs> point that they stop depredations. And in this particular case there, they've, I think they've only lost one sheep this oh. year, whereby in the next valley over, they're not using any of these techniques. They're still losing a lot of sheep. They're grumbling about it. Um, another thing they're doing, of course, it, it's taking a lot of time and effort. They have people out there with radio telemetry, and they have fixes on these wolves. So then they know when a pack comes near, they know, let's get ready, and uh, they prepare. And one of the things they do, if they find wolves getting too snoopy around the sheep, they shoot them. Not, not with uh, lethal ammunition, but with like rubber bullets and cracker mm. shells. They scare them away. They teach them a lesson, like you would a dog. You know, right. this is adverse of training. And uh, it's been, they've had really good luck with that. Uh, I will also mention again that the grumblings are that, yeah, this takes a lot of time, like it takes a lot of effort, and it takes money. I mean, you just, you, you have to put those three things into this for this to work, and a lot of ranchers say, we don't have that sort of money. But my argument would be is that we spend a lot of money on other things like killing predators that might be used towards these non-lethal, um, or putting your money behind seeing exactly. Now, yeah. Defenders is putting up the money for this. It's a non-profit group. You know, I think the government wanna, might want to start helping out and seeing, hey, is there another option to just slaughtering these animals, which we now find increasingly are very uh, increasingly important members of the ecological community. Let me ask you a more esoteric question, only because yeah. you brought it up in your book. Oh, <laughs> we were oh. talking earlier about how um, large predators, top predators, uh, can increase the, the health of, of their prey and so on and can have a positive effect on them. Is there any positive effect on humans living in an environment that still has predators? Since most of us live in a, a predator-free zone, like all of us here in West Virginia, um, do people need 
predators. We, 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 we seem to think we know elk do, <laughs> certain marine <laughs> species and, and, <laughs> and birds, songbirds and so on, but yeah. do people need predators? Well, you know, I, I did mention maybe that, that connection to Lyme disease as one example, but I, I, I sense you're asking more on yeah, perhaps I'm not asking Lyme personal, disease. <laughs> didn't think so. Um, yeah, and this, one's, this one's really tricky, but in, on a psychological basis, you know, people have long realized that, you know, and, and, and um, Edward O. Wilson has mentioned this and, and made, a, um, made the, the idea famous about biophilia, the love of life, and that we are genetically ingrained, you know, to, to, to be interested in the life around us. And that goes, I think, especially so for some of the big carnivores because, you know, they were around when we were, when we were evolving out on the African plains. I mean, these were our, our primary competitors. These were the things that used to eat us. And, you know, they taught us a whole lot. And so, um, you know, they, they not only taught us to be afraid of them, they taught us things like fascination and they taught us how to stalk and how to, you know, to be stealthy. And, and um, they taught us humility. They taught us a lot of really, I, I think, valuable human traits, some of the ones that really, we really hold dear as a human species. And um, I think right now we don't know what's going to happen without them. You know, are we, gonna, are we all going to die for lack of big predators? Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that's, I don't think, I think that's the wrong question. I think the question is, you know, what is life going to be like without them? And not only, you know, the fact that we don't, most of us live without them anyway, you know, because they're not around, but just to know that they're not out there anymore. I mean, there's, there's a psychological uh, void there that I'm, I'm afraid that, you know, we're going to find out in one way or the other. You know, I, right. it may happen sooner or later, but, um, you know, what's that going to mean to the human psyche to realize that there's nothing out there that's, that's more dangerous than you? That, that's that, something that could put you in your place. It's something that could inspire the sort of awe that a creature that could potentially kill you can inspire. And that's, that's the thing that's it's, it's immeasurable so far, as far as I know, but, but I know that, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's short-sighted to say that, you know, having evolved with these animals for 99% of our history yeah. as a species to say that all of a sudden, well, we don't need them, I, I think is a bit of hubris. Yeah. That's a good answer. Thank you. It does lead to another question, though. If you, if you live in a area without predators. Um, people have been arguing, at least in this country, at the federal level since the 20s and 30s, well, humans now are the, the top predator, and we have to take over that mm -hmm. management function. Yep. Are there examples, did you come across, I mean, come across any in your book of, of places where the, the management was intensive enough for us to take over the wolf's role or, or other predator roles, or is, are there too many encumbrances to that? Well, we're certainly trying. I mean, mm -hmm. Uh, right now in uh, in Fairfax County, of course, we are you know we have we have sharpshooters, trained sharpshooters, going out in the parks at night that are trying to keep the dirt deer her herd right. down just to keep the the ecological integrity of that park going. Um, you know, but it's not it, you know you can't you can't really play a wolf or a cougar you know because so much that goes into this ecology of fear that I mentioned you know right. you just if you're out there you know for a few nights in the spring or the fall and you know. Um, you know, just for a few hours, you've got people gunning things. It's just not the same. And so that, that is a fact. I mean, that when people have compared, uh, the, you know, hunters, human hunters versus the, the four-legged professional hunters, um, they, just, they just haven't, they've really fallen short in terms of, of managing the prey um, the way, you know, the ones that were, had evolved to manage the prey. You know, that wasn't us. You know, we've taken that over, but, you know, we're still bumbling at it. And, uh, you know, we've got, a, we've got many, many millions of years to learn the trick, like, you know, our, our competitors or right. our, our fellow predators have. Plus, we'd have to manage the planet's prey <laughs> instead of just one species we co-evolved with. Like yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's way beyond us. It's way, and, and, you know, that's the thing. Why, why would we want to, you know, unless we were... F and, you know, frankly, to be, to be pessimistic about this, you know, that it may, there may become a time when, you know, we've got 11 billion people on this planet mm -hmm. and there just isn't enough space anymore for the big animals. But I'd, I'd like to think that somehow we're going to figure out a way to keep them around because, uh, you know, that everything I'm, I'm learning about them says that, that we are sorely going to miss them when they're gone. Well, that leads to my final question. Are yeah. you optimistic or pessimistic? Do you think these scientists you've studied that have, have come up with these theories are going to um, be successful in, in changing attitudes and, and management mm -hmm. styles? Or yeah. um, do you think there's other factors that are, are precluding that? No, I, I don't think science is going to save the day. 
I, I don't think people are going to change their minds about big predators because of what's in my book or what any scientist is, is coming out with these days. Um, it hasn't so far, and, and as I mentioned in my, in my closing chapter, I think it's all about, you know, the space between our ears is what's really going to decide, um, you know, whether or not we we can tolerate big predators into the future, and, and that's that's a hard one. You know, I'd, I'd like to think that some something could happen, you know, something none of us can anticipate that could happen in terms of ch swaying our view of nature um, radically, and it, and it may be a very abrupt and nasty sort of change in humanity, I don't know, but I would like to think that something might come along and save us from, from where it appears that we're heading now. If, we're, if we are heading towards 11 billion people here shortly, then, um, you know, I, I don't help hold out a whole lot of hope for big populations of wide-ranging predators like this, but um, I'm always willing to, <laughs> to accept that possibility that, that, you know, they may be around for a while, and, yeah. and we will too. Maybe your book will be the first clarion call <laughs> on that. We did begin with Silent yeah. Spring, so yeah. this could be an <laughs> appropriate analogy. But, yeah, Will, thank yeah. you so much for yeah, your time you yeah. this afternoon. And then tonight you're going to give a public talk out here. Yep. I'd like to thank all of you who took the hour to tune in to hear Will's fascinating exposition on, on the role of top predators and, and hear a really good synopsis of his, his excellent new book. And uh, thank you very much. We'll see you next month when we have our newest conservationist in action.